Way back, we talked about individuals becoming defensive during their stage two arousal. And when that happens, we often need to use an approach that we can summarize as setting limits. I'm not a big fan of this terminology, but it has become a widely understood terminology in the field. I think it's an easier thing to describe it as helping people to see the choices that they're making. And this approach, or dialectic approach, is very important both in a crisis moment and, frankly, even more effective in a non-crisis moment. It's been used very effectively with people, for example, who have personality disorders or people who have developmental challenges. So what is meant by setting limits? Well, it's helping the individual to see how their behavior really is a choice. You know, if you think about it, you're sitting right now in front of a computer taking this training, and it's a choice that you made. But it's interesting because not only did you make the choice to do that, but you're also choosing at the same time not to do a number of other things. And those things include everything from the obvious, such as you're choosing not to watch TV right now, but also some things that might seem banal, but they are what allow you to be functioning in society. You've chosen right now not to go outside without your clothing on. You've chosen not to be violent to somebody who did you harm in the past. You've chosen not to spend all your money on things that are illicit or harmful to you. And many of the people that we support literally have difficulty with those same sorts of choices. So we want people to see the range of possibilities. And for people who have impulse control disorders, for people who are younger and may not have much life experience, for people who live in, uh, in some form of altered state due to medication side effects or because they've used substances, or for people who may have limited thinking just as a virtue of their mental health disorder, they may not always see the options in front of them. And we need to sometimes be creative and insightful in helping people to see what they're really choosing. And we need to frame their choices in a way that makes a big difference, even though sometimes these are subtle differences in how we communicate, they can be very important in helping people to make to be led to the choice that's going to be more functional for them and probably for you. So we want to make the choice, which is also called the contingency, very clear. And this is a way of avoiding power struggles and escalation so that people aren't seeing that as something that they're going to get from you or something that's obviously and inevitably going to lead them to anger. They have to see that there is another path. So here's an example of this. George will go to the mall as soon as your room is clean is a much better variation on something that we hear from people like, for example, if you don't clean your room, you're not going anywhere. Or clean your room right now because I told you. Or if you don't clean your room, you'll be sorry. Or you better clean your room right now. You're not getting anything from me until you do that. All of these are things that we hear, and another one that I didn't say that we, we can use one of our famous flag words is, uh, if you, cleaning your room is expectation around here, it's the rules, or it's not appropriate for you to go out leaving your room messy, and none of those are effective. And I don't know that they've ever been effective in working with people in care, working with youth, working with students, or even in our own families. They generally don't work. And it's funny because our memory is that somehow those things worked on us, when in truth, we probably didn't respond to them very well either and, and ultimately only responded when we were disciplined by a person who was older or more powerful than we were. So this statement, George, will go to the mall as soon as your room is clean, is what we call a positive contingency. What makes it a positive contingency? Well, it describes to George what he will get if he does what we and what we hope he wants. The positive or pro-social behavior is being described as a contingency with a positive reinforcer. And that's a far more powerful thing than talking about the undesired or troublesome behavior being in a contingency with a punishment or an undesired response. And you'll notice that I like to use the words as soon as or as a variation when instead of just saying if and then. So I could have said, George, if you clean your room, we'll go to the mall. But what's better is as soon as describes that the contingency is truly in George's hands, that George owns the power here. And if, it's, if he cleans his room faster, he gets to do the activity faster and probably for longer. And this is taking into consideration something called the PREMAC principle, which is a very simple idea. 
what it simply says is we're more likely to do a less preferred activity if it is followed by a more preferred activity. And this is particularly true if when we get the chance to do this preferred activity is somewhat in our control. So we really want to try rephrasing. And if you're the kind of person that finds yourself quickly going to statements such as, if you don't do blank, really work hard at switching that up. Instead of saying no to somebody, tell them yes based on some later contingency. So it may be, no, we're not going now, but we could say, yes, we're going to go after supper. Or instead of saying, no, you didn't clean your room, we can do what we learned a few minutes ago using educational correction, which is simply a positive contingency for the next time. So instead of saying, no, you didn't clean your room, George, what we'll say is, Yes, we can go to the mall the next time we ask you to clean your room, and you, I know you're going to do a good job of it. And that might sound like it's really manipulative, and if you're not sincere in saying it, it probably will come across that way. But as you get more in tune with what you're saying and genuinely think about its value, you're probably going to communicate it in a more sincere and more impactful way. So there are a number of keys to setting limits, and we're going to focus on three of them just to keep it simple in this course. Number one, keep it simple. So we want to make our limits very clear, very concise, and we want to focus on what people are to do, their behavior, as opposed to how we want them to be. Remember that abstract concepts are often lost on people who are not completely mentally present. In fact, sometimes they're difficult for everybody. If I told you that we're going out tonight on a date and it's really important for you to behave in a formal way, I'm guessing it would cause you some stress. You probably wouldn't quite know what I meant by formal and would indeed ask me some questions until I was able to tell you specifically things like table manners, dress, and modes of speech that I mean by formal. So we want to cut right to the mustard, as they say, and focus directly on what we want a person to do. And I'm very, very concrete. So for example, I may say something like this. If you can have your shower completed by 9 o'clock, we'll be able to watch the entire episode of such and such TV program. And it's a really simple, concise way for that person. If they finish watching, if they finish having their shower at 9.05, the beautiful thing is that the consequence of that is built right in to what happens. They don't need me to be the one who puts it on them. And so it's really nice and simple and it's really doable for the person, which takes me to the next one. Ensure that limits are reasonable and manageable. So if we give people too many limits all at once, too much feedback all at once, it's going to be overwhelming and impossible for them to absorb. And if we give them expectations that are unreasonable, again, the person is going to simply throw up their hands, give up, and conclude that you are not an ally. And this happens quite frequently with me because even though I'm teaching college students, every once in a while, some of them will think that they really don't need to submit the work, that just by coming to class and participating, they are going to, uh, they're going to pass. And then some of them come to a point where they're about to go on their practicum or clinical placement, and they realize that they're behind by five or six or seven assignments, and they come to me, and I have to make a decision at that point. Because what I could say to that person is, all of that work is due in two or three or four days. But if I do that, I might as well just simply tell the person that they're going to fail the program. Because realistically, no way can they do that and do it effectively. So instead what I do is I say to the person, I'm going to pick two of those assignments. They're going to be due in four days, which is going to be challenging, but, re but reasonable. And then we're going to set a target for two more, and then we're going to set a target for the last two. So I keep my, uh, my limit manageable, reasonable, but still there is a natural consequence, or in this case a logical consequence, for the person putting off that schoolwork. They still are going to have to endure some amount of stress. It's just going to be manageable. And at the end of the day, they get the job done, and that's what really matters. And the limits must be enforceable. In other words, don't make idle promises and threats. If you tell somebody you're going to go to the movies when they're finished, a chore, go to the movies. If you tell a person that you're going to apply or let a natural or logical consequence come into effect, don't relieve them of that natural or logical consequence. Let it actually happen. And if you're dealing with this circumstance with a person and they become somewhat emotional about that, they show you disappointment or sadness, 
don't immediately think you've done something wrong and work to relieve it because that person's emotional response is telling you that they have learned that there is a negative effect to not living up to the contingency. If you keep removing that consequence, then the person is going to learn that your choices or your limits are meaningless. So we want to set enforceable limits and we want to keep them enforced. Don't make idle threats to people, particularly to young people, because they're often looking for ways to demonstrate that they should be considered as powerful adults. And they'll often test the limits. And then you'll be in a circumstance where you can't do anything about it. They will learn that you cannot be relied upon when you come in and you offer one of these contingencies and you will have a harder time in the future. So it's important that we, we maintain our integrity, that we keep our word, whether it's implying a consequence or applying a reinforcer. We have to be quick to do that. We have to do it without any particular derivative pleasure if we're applying a consequence and with all kinds of pleasure when we're applying a reinforcer with tremendous enthusiasm for that person. And we want to describe positive contingencies, as I said before. Focus on what you think the person is going to be able to do and what they'll get out of it. And in fact, I like to use a technique called pre-praise and another technique called positive suggestion. And they really seamlessly go together. Suggestion simply means I tell a person, sometimes in words this direct, I know you're going to be successful. So I might have an individual who comes into my care, they're in a day program, for example, that I run, and they've been struggling for the last few days to get through a full day. What I might say to that person is something like, I know you're going to have a great morning, or I know you're going to have a great first hour. And then as we get close to the end of that hour, I might give them another propelling remark that suggests to them that I have faith in them for the, for the next hour. That is a very compelling and powerful approach to keeping people thinking positively and knowing that you are their ally. And the, the, the pre-praise part of that is exactly what it sounds like. I give them praise before they've actually ever done something. And it's just like going to a grocery store and getting a free sample. It makes you want more. And so what I do with people, they walk in the room in that circumstance and say something to this effect. I know you're gonna have a great morning keep it up, you're doing awesome already, or thank you, or good job. And the person has never once said to me, what did you say good job to me for? I haven't done anything yet. What I'm doing is I'm showing the person so much evidence that I have faith in them that they often themselves begin to have faith. And that goes back to this idea we talked about earlier in one of the modules of Albert Bandura's theory of self-efficacy. If a person believes that you, as a powerful, significant other, have faith in them, it will improve their belief in having faith in themselves. So we're going to end with a journal exercise. How would you respond to the following things being said to you? Number one, why do I have to do my homework before dinner? Number two, who made you the boss? Number three, no, I'm not doing it and you can't make me. Number four, go ahead and try. I'll get you back later when you aren't paying attention. And number five, a physical response this time, not verbal, the person waves their fist in your face. Take a few minutes to respond in your journal and we'll come back and conclude the module by giving you a brief idea as to how we might respond to each of these five types of defensive behavior.